Welcome to the Executive Lounge, the business leadership show that brings you insights and experiences from men and women who have scaled the daunting heights of starting, managing and growing businesses from various sectors across the country and around the world. Today we're joined by a man who you could call consistent. He's always been a lawyer and he's always worked for just the one firm. He's risen through the ranks to be managing partner today. My guest is lawyer, activist, passionate Ghanaian, Ace Kojo Anan Ankuma of Bentienchi, Lecha and Ankuma, arguably Ghana's biggest law firm. Welcome to the Executive Lounge. Thank you, thanks for having me. Good to see you. Yeah. It's been a while. Yes, you, you've been busy. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's quite interesting. I mean, we do get together virtually every day. Yeah, on the platform. So, exactly. But it kind of feels like, uh, you know, we see each other, but actually we haven't seen each other in a while. That's right, quite a bit. Yeah, you do look well. Well, I try. Not, not half as well as you look all the time. <laughs> I, I try to look like you. Mine is more make-believe. Oh, well, well then, uh, then, then, you're, you're the real deal. You, you make and I believe. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to catch up with you yes, um, and hoping that we can learn a lot from you. I hope so. um, a lot of people know you for your prowess as a, a lawyer, but not as much about the person uh, Kojo Ananankuma. So <laughs> tell us about your upbringing and family life as a child. Mm, I don't know about prowess as a lawyer. I just go to work and do a day's job. And um, anyway, well, um, I was born almost 50 years ago um, to, a, to obviously to a father and mother. My dad worked with Ghana Railways, and um, so we did a mo some movement from Tema to Takra de Accra um, as the railways developed. Mm. My mother, for the most part of her life, was a homemaker, so she was home. Um, she was raising six children. I have five sisters. I'm an only boy. Mm. And I'm right in the middle. I have two, two elder sisters and three younger sisters. Um, did schooling in services primary in Takradi and moved from there. Spent a term at uh, Master Sam in Cape Coast after common entrance and then went to Fanspum. From Fanspum, I did form one chapter 16 in Fanspum. Then from Fanspum, I went on to University of Ghana, um, three years in the, the Battle of Laws program and then went to the Ghana School of Law for two years for the qualifying certificate. Um, spent a year, yeah, the, then went on to Queen's University to study for my master's. In between these, I did a one-year national service teaching math and English at a school I'll never forget. It, uh, it was an Islamic school, the Makaranta schools in Nima, called Usamat Bunzaid. Wow. It was one of the most fulfilling uh, moments of my life when I was teaching young kids who were studying um, the Quran and, and, and Islamic studies and, and Arabic. And there was a project to introduce math and English into their curriculum. And so we were sent as national service personnel to teach. It was a mud building with just two, two or so classrooms or three classrooms at, at, at most. And it was a joy going in there and starting A, B, C, D with the students and one, two, three. And by the time I was leaving, they were doing long division and writing little essays. And so it was, it's always been a source of pride. I wish I could meet some of those people today, but it's been so many years. I mm. mean, that, that's probably 86 to 87. Then I spent a year as a teaching assistant at the Ghana, at University of Ghana. Mm -hmm. That's between 92 and 93. And um, then between 93 and 94, I studied for my master's. I was away for 11 months. It was, it was, supposed, to have, it was supposed to have been 12 months. But I guess I've always been in a hurry. <laughs> and so I, I um, finished my master's at the age of 26. I became a lawyer at 20, 24, finished my master's at 26. So I left Legon at 22, finished, became a lawyer at 24, finished my master's at 26. But for the two years of national service, I'd have, I'd have finished all my law programs at 24. Mm -hmm. And then I flew to Ghana the day after I defended my thesis. I defended my thesis on 11th July. On 12th July, I was on a plane to London. I arrived in Accra on 14th July and got married on 23rd July. Wow. <laughs> you so were I, in a hurry. I, I've always been a young man in a hurry. <laughs> I, I, wonder, I wonder what I was in a hurry for. But yes, I, 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 so literally by the time I married and settled down, I'd never lived on my own. I'd always been at home, my parents' home, and then in school. So, so the, the 11 or so months in, in Queens, Kingston, Ontario, Canada, was probably the first time I'd lived on my own. And then I came back and within nine days, I was married. So. Wow. Uh, but my, my independence has just been 
um, 11 months and 9 days. <laughs> That's good. Interesting story. But um, what would you say the experience, all of this put together, how has that put you in the state you find yourself today? Well, one of the things was that I, I, I went to school a bit early, you know, and I did, I did everything a bit early. Um, and so by the age of 26, I, was, I decided that I was not going to do, pursue a PhD program. And you can imagine, I mean, you, you might call a 26-year-old quite a kid still, but I was taking a, a, a life decision mm -hmm. that this is not what I want to do with my life. I, I didn't want, to, and I said, I broke it down this way. And apologies to my friends with PhD in law, but I said I don't want to spend four years of my life studying the same area of law just to get a couple of alphabets before my name. And um, so although I had the option to stay in Canada, work with at, at, at University, University of Ottawa doing research for a year, and then get into a PhD program, I kind of turned my back on it and came to Ghana. Um, I, ju I just believe that you, if possible, you should do this education thing early. And get it out of the way, and then try, and then and then dive into life. But also, if you are not, unable to get it out of the way early, don't give up on it. I probably was lucky because my parents took me to school early, and um, were there for the most part. When after my dad died in 1987, and it was tough, I still went to school. I mean, somehow my mother made sure we, we all went to school. There were very very tough moments. The moments of no money. The moments when one had to sleep hungry because things kind of went um, belly up after he died. And that was just before I entered the University of Ghana. But somehow, I went through it. There was, there was never a thought that it's time to stop and do something else. But at 26, I, I thought I'd had enough. And so I've, I haven't been to school again since I was 26. That was 24 years ago. The last time I sat in a classroom was 24 years ago. Wow. So you made that conscious decision that you were not going to pursue further education after the Masters. And you jumped into uh, Bentian, Chill and Lecher at the time. Yes, I had... The, that, that's always an interesting story. In 1992, after I wrote my exams, my final by exams, I, I needed money. <laughs> I needed to work. <laughs> and I was only a lawyer. I was nothing else. I wasn't even a lawyer. I hadn't been called to the bar. And I, I asked a friend of mine, Professor Botry, he's now Associate Dean at Carter University. Professor Francis Botry was my classmate. I said, Francis, which are the law firms that pay salaries? Because <laughs> really, I needed somebody where I was going to be paid. He gave me three firms. I went to the first firm. I was kept at recession for, at the recession for three days. I never saw the boss. I still had my CV in my hands. And so after three days, I got frustrated. And I went to the second on the list. And I, I was carrying my application letter, my CV, and all the articles I'd written. Wow. So I went in there. I saw the boss, Kujo Bentiential. He ushered me into his office. And we had a conversation. And that was supposed to be the interview. And um, we had a very interesting discussion then. Then he said he would hire me, but first as a proofreader to work on in a subsidiary firm of the, of the law firm, subsidiary company of the law firm that was then compiling Ghana's laws into a database, into a hypertext database. And they needed some people to basically edit the stuff. And um, he understood that I would be doing my national service at Legon at the same time. But he told me that you're not gonna get <laughs> you're not gonna get free pass. You still owe me 40 hours a week of work. And so I started working before I was even called to the bar. After I was called to the bar and I was posted to University of Ghana as a teaching assistant, I was still, I was still fielding 40 hours a week doing the proofreading and editing stuff. So, so I'll go to Legon. you were doing 80 hours because uh, Legon expected yes, you to Legon do 40 expected, as well. And, and, and I, I've, I've been a bit of a, of, a, of a workaholic all along because in Legon, I had the option of just TAing for two subjects. I was doing four. I was TAing for Professor Kumado's thoughts. I was TAing for uh, Professors uh, Kwenye here, Professor Mensah Bumswen, the lead justice of first uh, criminal law. I was TAing um, um, Justice, uh, no, Professor Mills, President Mills' commercial law mm -hmm. uh, class, both in the faculty and at the School of Admin. Wow. So I was, I was a TA both in the Faculty of Law and the School of Administration, where one of my sisters was my student. Um, but I, had, I had such interesting people in my tutorial class, like um, Dom, uh, Dr. Dominic Aine, who is now uh, Attorney General, uh, who was Deputy Attorney General. Mm -hmm. um, they, 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 were, they, they, they were the naughty students at the time and would come for tutorials with all kinds of naughty questions. And <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure about, about what, the relationship was, what the relationship was at the time. But yes, I, I kind of started everything maybe too early. But by that time, I'd gone through all of this. So, so I, did, I, did, I, was, I was pulling in my, because you're, you're attending lectures, mm -hmm. you're attending tutorials, you're reviewing, um, um, reading lists, 
and in, two, in one faculty in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the school of admin. Then I was putting 40 hours. I used to go to work on Saturdays and Sundays so I can make my salary uh, from, 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 from the law firm and, and, and the database. So I did that through 92 to 93 before I, uh, before I left for, for, for Canada. Yeah. That's a very interesting <laughs> story. Those are two jobs. You know, um, and uh, you pulled through all of this. Now you describe yourself as a young man that was in a hurry and you did a lot of things. But how are you able to still not just breeze through this, but actually do them well grounded? I believe that anything that is worth doing is worth doing well. And especially if you know that there's nothing to fall back on but the hard ground. You can't slack. I mean, there's, not, there, 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 there's no bridge behind you to defend. You, you, just, you, you just have to go forward. And so it was, it was not a question of, um, it, it wasn't an option. Mm. I mean, failure wasn't an option. I'll, I'll tell you a story. Uh, it, it's, not, it's, it's not all being smooth. Um, when my older boy results came, I, had a, I, was at, I was at a borderline grade one. I had literally failed math and general science. I had seven and eight. It was not a failure. Nine was failed, but mm -hmm. seven and eight were pretty, pretty much close. Yeah. And, and I couldn't have entered any university with those grades. So I actually went to Mfans Mseth Form as a borderline student. And whilst a lot of my friends had distinctions and were in, I was their borderline grade one, ag borderline grade one, aggregate 24. Mm -hmm. 25 was grade two. That's right. I think the whole Mseth uh, Form class, I was like, <laughs> for the last people <laughs> to be admitted into the school. I am pretty certain that had I not been an old boy, I might not have been admitted. But I went in and... Um, the, 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 that was a life-changing experience because suddenly I was, I, was, I, was, I was within my own. I liked history, literature, and religious studies, and that was what I was studying, and it was, it was easy. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I could understand it. I, was, I didn't have to grapple with any math and general science and those things that were difficult at the time, at the time, not now. Yeah. But, um, so I was not a particularly, um, uh, I, nobody expected me to do very well in sixth form, but by God's grace and by him opening my eyes to hard work and the fact that I could read and understand, the guy who squeaked and somehow sneaked into safe form, mm -hmm. I graduated on top of the class at A level, mm -hmm. you know, which was like, whoa, where's this from? But so I surprised myself and I, could, I couldn't pass the math in general science. So when I, I was senior scholar in France, the best graduating student, best, I won the K. Buzi Award in, in, uh, in the best student in humanities, I still had to write math in general science. So after A levels, I came and sat at home and bought about 10 years of past questions, pulled out the textbooks that I hadn't read <laughs> you know, in the five years yeah, leading right. to my O level and taught myself. And I wrote the October, November and got three, two grade threes. And that then pushed me into University of Ghana the next year. Fantastic. So you didn't give up, but you, you kind of kept going forward, keeping your eye on what was unfinished. I mean, really, I, did, I, did I have a choice? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what was I going to do? My dad, at the time, before he died, had literally been forced out of Ghana and lived in Nigeria. Uh, what was I going to do? Go, go and live with him and pound for, for him every day? I had, I had to move forward. And, you know, uh, I always say that failure... Um, ha, ha, has no breeding grounds where determination and dedication lie. Mm. It was one of my personal mantras. I, I, was, I, I, I live with mantras. There's always something that I'm, I'm meditating day in, day out. So it kind of became uh, uh, you know, embedded in me. I imbibed it. And so I, the, the, the only way available was forward. There was nothing else to fall back on, especially after he died. That, that was it. How did you settle on law? Wow. It was much earlier than I thought. My dad had two friends. One was a friend, one was also a friend, and he worked with him at Ghana Railways. They were lawyers, mm. um, lawyer Isel and lawyer Carson. We lived next door to lawyer Carson, and I think he's still alive. Um, we lived at number 11, uh, Windy Ridge, and he lived at number 10. Um, we used to go to his house a lot because he had, he had the Abrofonkatia tree, and we had the guava tree. So okay, it was a, so it was a butter tree. Almonds for guava. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and so we... we um, but, and, and apart from the fact that he had three very pretty daughters, but I was too young to, to know that at the time. But your eyes could still see. Right? Oh, 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 I was too young to see. But, okay. but we, 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 so I, I, I used to see him a lot. He was calm, extremely calm, very quiet. And I, I've been noisy since I was a kid. Even when I was a stammer, I was still noisy. And, um, but I used to admire him. And then he had a friend who came from England, and he was a lawyer, and he was more out there, you know. And I just admired them and said, oh, wow, I'm going to be a lawyer. But this is interesting. There's a kid who has a stammer saying he's going to be a lawyer. My primary school teachers have um, 
tell me stories of how I'd be arguing and can't speak a word because I was, you know, stumbling, but still arguing in the, in the midst of the stammer. I somehow got over it. A few times I still stammer. If you listen to me closely, I right. still stammer in a few words, like my soft vowels, and my, stuff, my soft con consonants. But I went through that, and so that was all I was going to be. I didn't, have, I didn't have any interest. When in Form 3, I was failing. I mean, look, by Form 3, I was failing. If I, if schools at the time repeated, I would have been repeated. Mm. By Form 3, I was failing. You know, you have to do what was called special science and special math. Special science and special math determine whether you're going to be a science student or an art student. That's right. I, I had 9% in, in math. <laughs> look, there was a time I got half percent in French. <laughs> <laughs> I had 9% in math and I had like 27% in the sciences. So I was in the bottom class, what we call the 4G2. So 4M1 were the brainiacs, mm -hmm. then 4M2, 4S, G1 were the bright art students, and G2 was for the sound class. We were, we were destined to fail. And so I was in 4G2. There's, there's nothing to be proud about. But you discovered hard work and that changed everything. Absolutely. That, I mean, the, the time between the O level. I mean, I, I, well, my results were not good, but I was, I, I was happy with it. I, I thought I was going to fail outright. So, having gotten those grades, I knew I could build up from there. And once I, I got into my own, so in Form 3, I went to see a teacher and said, um, <laughs> I, I think I was, I was quite well known for not being smart, and said, if I want to be a lawyer, which subject should I study? He had a good laugh. He said, you, law? <laughs> Look at you. Anyway, you, you have a choice with math, you have to do it. You have the choice with general science, you have to do it. You're okay in English, so you're compulsory three. You have to do literature because you, uh, law will require a lot of reading. At best, after laughing at me, uh, law will require a lot of reading. History, because that will help you. And religious studies, you need it, you're quite naughty. <laughs> so do, do Bible knowledge. And I couldn't find a seven, sub, a seven subject. Now, all of that time, you have to do, you have to do mm -hmm. seven, eight, or nine subjects. Because you have your six compulsory. Oh, I have three compulsory and, and then three optional. I knew, right. I knew the fourth optional, mm -hmm. and I couldn't find one. Wow. I went to economics class. Once I saw that graph with a curve and it meant something, I fled. I, I couldn't find a seventh subject. I went, in, I went into geography because I didn't have any, and I had to find one to be in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the story is not all rosy. Um, I, I, I needed to grow up. I needed to discover who I was and what my purpose was. And I think once I found it, I kind of you know, moved in that groove. And, 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 and with God's help and, and blessings, I got to where I, where, where I wanted to be. So here I am thinking I know quite a bit about you, but I'm discovering a whole new side to uh, Kojoana and Kumar, and it's intriguing. We're going to take a short break, and uh, when we come back, we're going to learn a lot more. I think uh, there's some more intriguing stuff at the ACE's sleeve, and we'll share them with you in a moment. This is the Executive Lounge, and we'll be back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge, and uh, we're continuing to learn more from Ace Anan Ankuma. Uh, we'll talk about Chelsea at some point. Uh, that, that, I can't allow this uh, conversation to end without uh, our football banter. But in the first uh, part of the conversation, he's told us about his determination and uh, his love for hard work and how that transformed uh, what others would have thought was a person who was not going to be any good to the top of his class at A level. Now, hard work and determination are great values and attitudes to have. What other values did you have in your arsenal to uh, conquer the odds before you? Well, I, if I learned anything from my dad, it was to be true to yourself. He was true to himself to a fault. He was so true to himself that he was retired at the age of 38 by the government. Uh, because he had, they, you know, they, they, just could, they just could not work with him. So at the end of, at the end of 38, um, the, 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 then the champion government threw it to him that, look, you just can't, you can't continue to work here anymore. And he said, I'd, I'd rather retire. So he retired at the age of 38. He didn't resign. He retired, actually, at the age of 38. And um, I've always been taught to be true to myself, to be honest to myself, acknowledge that I'm human, I have feelings, I'm not Superman. Um, real supermen, as I like to say, don't leap over buildings. They take determined, little, little determined steps consistently. And um, that's what I learned from my, from my dad and from my mom. My mom was a homemaker, but she also sewed a lot. And in, in instilling discipline, like sit down and do your homework. Mm -hmm. If you do not finish your homework, you don't get up to play. Um, and so I learned how to do my homework very quickly. And so I learned things like, Right. I, I, I needed to play, so I, I wrote very quickly. I thought about the stuff before I sat down. 
So, so I spent as little time as possible behind the table doing the, doing the homework. And we did the homework in my, my mom's sewing room. And you know, the sewing room is at the corner of the, of the, of the living room. And, that, and so you might miss Osofodazi because you haven't done your homework. And my dad would wait. Just when Osofodazi is about to start, he will ask for your homework. And you've not done it. You go to the room and do your homework. So you miss Osofodazi. And you might have to wait and watch it on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there, was, there was that after everybody else had watched it, and they literally spoiled your fun because they, they would have told you what happened. Mm -hmm. I, I do remember very well. There was one, Abyssinia. It was, it was a very deep Osofodazi one with ghosts and stuff. And I would have loved to watch it. But I was locked in the sewing room doing my homework. Wow. And so I learned to do and do things very quickly so I could make time. I learned how to make time, create time. People say you do a lot. 24 hours is not enough. I say 24 hours is more than enough. Right from, from that age, I learned how to sleep only as much as I needed. Because I needed time to do, a lot, to, to do a lot of things. I needed to play. I needed to do all the things that I wanted to do. And so I learned those values from him. So I learned to be true to myself and also to um, recognize, like I said, your strengths and your weaknesses mm -hmm. and, how to, and how to play them up, how to leverage yourself from there. I learned to recognize the power, the power of authority, how to be under authority and to be of authority. And so I learned those, those things from my dad at a rather early age, um, that if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. You know, the, the, the tough times in his life. Um, he had to leave Ghana, who live in Nigeria. Ultimately, he died at the age of 48. Um, but he, 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 he stood up. That's a very strong pillar in my life. And um, together with my mom, they, 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 they're both dead now. But I learned a lot from those, and I learned those values. Hard work, dedication, respect for authority, and generally try to be a good boy. You're, I feel 99% of the time, but at least I try 1%. Well, you've got to keep going, I, I guess. i got to try. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you started working, um, putting together the hypertext database. Eventually, you worked yeah. at uh, Bentiancho yes. as a lawyer. I so. I did a bit of that in law, and then I left for Canada, came back in July of 1994, and started working in September, um, working in the two firms. And then I moved fully into the law practice as an associate. Mm -hmm. I was an associate, so that must have been from 95 to, hmm, I think, 2000, then I made partner. And then in 2010, I made managing partner. So I went, I went through the whole gamut of, you know, associate, senior associate into partnership in technically five years. It, no, it normally takes longer, mm. but in five years, I, was, I, I made partner. So I was partner for 10 years. And then I was made managing partner. For so the you just kept years. leaping over hurdles. You're just in a rush. Now, really, let, let's say I'm boring. Let's say I'm a coward. Let's say I don't like challenges. I've worked at just one, one place my whole life. <laughs> the only other jobs I've done would have been the times I worked for, for data center, which was <laughs> the, the, when I went in Legon. And then during my master's, I was a research assistant. And I always have more than one job. I was mm -hmm. a research assistant. And then I was working the telephone. The telephone, you were three hours a day calling um, alumni and asking for money for the school. I always have more than one job. It's hardly a time when I do only one thing. Wow. So whilst in Queens, I was researching for Prof. Easton and being paid for it, working on telethon and then working on my, on my degree. So, um, um, so once I got back, that's what I went back straight back to the firm that um, 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 had me and I haven't gone anywhere else. Yes, I've attended job interviews. I dreamt of working with the United Nations. Now, this was interesting. I got headhunted head whilst I was in Queens to come to Washington for an interview for the UNHCR. And I thought, wow, I'm going to get a job in the UN. So I did that 18 hour tra uh, train ride from Montreal all the way to Washington. You know, got on the train, dressed in my best suit, and I was interviewed by a lady in t shirt, shorts, and sneakers <laughs> <laughs> and we had, for the yeah, party. absolutely i mean we had we had a great interview and at the end of it she said so um how well is your arabic i said huh so oh, we saw that you had taught in an arabic school i said i taught english in an arabic school I said oops um we need a second language well you're from west africa so you must speak french i remembered how i misbehaved in miss hardy's class and had half percent <laughs> I said, no, no French. I said, okay, this is going to be a tough one. Mm. Anyway, but um, they will still keep you on our roster. 
And I think the first offer was to go to Tanzania because there was a Rwandan war and there were refugees mm -hmm. and they needed a, a legal officer. But by that time, I think my mind was kind of settled in Ghana. I'd gotten married, there was a baby coming along. I wasn't too interested in that. So I, I stayed. I didn't go. And so I've worked at the same place. <laughs> and really, if you sit at the, if you work at the same place for a while, I mean, people are going to leave, people are going to, you know, join you. So let's say it's just a natural progression. <laughs> Wow, that's quite interesting. But you've risen to become managing partner, um, and it speaks a lot of, about the firm that you know the promotion was done from within. What's the succession philosophy at uh, the law firm? Well, I think that the philosophy is still evolving, but um, here I was literally walked off the streets into the place. I didn't know anybody there. Uh, it speaks to the fact that. I have been lucky to stand on the shoulders of giants. I mean, Kojo Benzian is a colossus. Kukulecha is a giant. And, and they say that if you stand on the shoulders of a giant, you see far. Yes, right. And so a lot of it, I, 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 there's the foundations that they built because they, they, they literally you know, taught me. I remember the first time Kojo said I should go for computer training. I just finished law. I felt very good as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. He said I should go and train on computers. I told him that I was, not, I was not a secretary. He said, young man, if you know what's good for you, you will move right now into the training school. And he was running a training school at the time. And I went there and got bitten by the bug. And he literally had to drag me out from the programming class because he hadn't allowed me to do programming. And I'd moved, I'd done the web and the DBase and spreadsheets and I was actually moving into programming and he, he dragged me out of the place. But, the, but it, 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 it helped build, you know, my skills, my, set, my skill set. And so a lot of the things I do, I do with a lot of speed. I type with a lot of speed. I speak, obviously, with a lot of speed. I write with a lot of speed. I do a lot of things with a lot of speed, you know. So, yeah, that, 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 that was how things panned out, you know. But you, in all this time, um, you didn't just, you know, keep climbing. You must have done it in a short time. But do you remember any times that it was so tough that you felt, I need to dig deeper to keep going? What um, Kujo and Kweku did for me is that they, they could see my strengths. I'll tell you a story. There was an absolutely brilliant young uh, lawyer they had from Kenya. Mm. I'll never forget her. She'd come in. Her husband was working at Unilever at the time. She was, um, hey, she had a BCL from Oxford, you know, which is like the ish, you know, where, where English training is concerned. And she was working with us for a while. And she was called Janet. And Janet and I sat by each other. We were very good friends. But we argued all the time. And they would, they would always put us on the same job. And I'd be irritated because Janet and I were arguing all the time. We, we, we chatted, but on law, we chat, we argue quite a bit. And that's the crazy thing. We, we can disagree on, them, on the point. And then we'd go home. And by the time we come the next day, she's convinced I'm right. I'm convinced she's right. So we start. So you disagree day. again? You disagree again. <laughs> <laughs> Later, they said they, they just enjoyed that. So they'll throw the work at us, knowing that those two people will have a full argument. By the time they're done, we've covered every, every base in the law, and we can, we can do the work. The, the, the work. So um, at, along the line, you know, there were times when I thought, this is all, all I wanted to do. The idea of not doing, not doing a PhD kept haunting me. So I, I, I thought, should I go back to school? Um, but what am I going to do with it? You know, and... Um, but I have never really regretted um, being where I was and learning what I was learning. Mm -hmm. Because, you see, the, 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 look, Kujo is a visionary. This is a man who was building the hypertext of Ghana law in 1992 when there was no internet in Ghana, arguably. I mean, I first came across the internet in Queens in 1993. But he was thinking of hypertext law. I mean, it's, it's, and so if, if you have people like that providing the facility for you, and um, I, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little secret. You, you call me in the, in the morning and say, Ace, I want to interview you on a matter. <laughs> and I come and I, I spout the law. You think I'm, I must know a lot of law, you see. It's a trick. You not, note, I always negotiate time with you. That's right. If you call me and it's six, I'm not, I'm not speaking at six. I'm not speaking at seven. I'll speak to you at 7.45. I make a beeline to the office, unless I have the material with me, check the law, Read it for about five minutes. Know that because I, you, you have to, you have too much what you want to talk about. By the time you call me, I sound like a very learned man. It's been five minutes. 
So that's how come you've become a legal luminary. <laughs> I'm not a luminary at all. <laughs> I, have, I have not eliminated anything. I just have all of Ghana's laws, decided cases, law journal articles, sitting on my laptop or on my on the on the on the on the on the on the, on the, on the laptop that I'm, I'm I I I have, I have on I have with me, and so I just do a search. And it's hypertext, hyperlinked. And so it gives me all the times that that concept has been mentioned in the law. It has nothing to do with brilliance. It has everything to do with the tool. That's one of the secrets. So while some may take three, four days researching an issue, I have it in five minutes. And, and this was something that was developed more than 27 years yeah, ago. Absolutely, with, with absolutely no government support. It was a private project and it's worked. It hasn't made a lot of money. I think it's, it, 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 it's, it's not been profitable, but in terms of financial returns, but in terms of its value and worth, mm -hmm. it's absolutely more than paid for itself. Not in, you know, like I said, not, not, not in, in, in returns. And so happens that, and happen with, in some projects, I believe with Bath Awards, they, they've, they've merged the Ghana Law Report and the All England Law Report. So I have the benefit of getting all of English decided cases, all of Ghana's decided cases sitting on my computer. So as you say, it hasn't paid in CDs and passwords, but in terms of its it immense value to facilitating work. In, invaluable too. You know. Absolutely. Where do you see the future of law, the practice of law in Ghana? Um, we will have to grow, and then we will have to compete with artificial intelligence. Um, I don't, uh, some lawyers do not like it when I say these things, but our competition is really, um, is ultimately going to be computers. But we need to start consolidation of law firms. Mm. Our practices are a bit too small, a bit too niche to take on the big jobs. Look, a typical oil contract. They go through all the prospecting and then they have to drill. It's about 15 mini contracts, about six main contracts running to hundreds of pages. If it's given to you, it's a, let's, let's even say it's a thousand page. When, when are you going to finish reading it and give the legal advice? You need to departmentalize. You need to specialize. You need people in who do just that job and can advise on it. But what happens is that we do not get that um, it's a consolidation. Mm -hmm. And so we are a lot of, uh, quite a lot of individual lawyers living well, we're living okay. But the big ticket matters because we don't have the capacity, capacity. English law firms get it. South African law firms get it. And they do the work. And because law is available, they'll get a Ghanaian lawyer to advise on it for, for, for you know, a, a couple of thousands of dollars. And they'll make a the couple of hundreds, of hundreds of thousands of dollars. We need to start thinking about consolidation law firm in real terms and in this name, not just a, um, a group of people sharing rent and utilities, but the, 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 when our powers combine, Captain Planet, mm -hmm. you know, where your skill complements mine, where we are not in competition with each other when we work in the same firm, mm -hmm. but we complement and complete each other. So within the firm, it is not competition. It is complementing and completing so that what I don't know, you know, and we combine it. Until we get there, the big ticket matters will never come to us. And guess what? We won't, we won't even know that those ticket matters exist. Because particular, particular, particularly if it's business coming in, we'll never know because mm -hmm. they'll go to an English law firm. You know, we've done work and we don't know who the ultimate client is because a law firm engaged us and we gave advice. And we, we will never know who the, client, who the real client is. Although now we stop doing that. So... Um, we need the consolidation. We need to combine our strengths into stronger law firms competing for Ghana business out there. And then the other threat is artificial intelligence. It started affecting firms all over the world. Um, look, you can go to zoomlawyer.com, I believe that's it, and get a computer to give you legal advice on IP law. Because by hypertext and by artificial intelligence, big data, they've thrown all decisions in the US into one database and so you type your question and the, 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 the computer reads it and starts going through US law and the decisions and it gives you advice based on, based on the use of algorithms, right? Okay, this is your case. There are 26 cases in, that support you. There are 18 that are against you. This, according to this comput computer, that's how your case is about to end. That's legal advice. Now, that 
computer is not licensed to practice law. Mm -hmm. right? It's going to give legal advice. And so we have to deal with the threat but of, of, of artificial intelligence. But I always say that every threat is in itself an, an, an opportunity yeah. if you know how to leverage it. And so those, I think, are the, are the, are the threats to, to the legal practice in Ghana. Very interesting. And then you talked about consolidation. I know recently one of the uh, law firms had been acquired by a South African firm where it was a merger of I, some I, sort. I don't know the, uh, the full details of it, but it just tells you where the future, where, where the future is going. Mm -hmm. That If a South African firm believes that it needs a footprint in, major, in, in African countries, and I know about associations and tie-ups mm -hmm. with English firms, with American firms, um, it tells us where the future is going. Where you know, the, the, I, so I don't know the full details of it. I know that yeah. there's a change. I've mm -hmm. done work with them. I, I don't know whether it was a takeover or a merger or an yeah. acquisition. Those those fine details I do not know. But it's a clear sign of where we may be going. The consolidation has been preached across several sectors in Ghana. Everyone's saying, look, partnerships work elsewhere, but it doesn't work here. What inherently is our problem? I think it's cultural. You, you ask it, so, something I've been thinking about for a long time. I think it's cultural. Just, just going back a little bit, you see, the evolution of company law in England was that people realized they couldn't make it alone. So they started forming what they call the guilds. So you have the cloth, she has the, the, the thread, I sew. We value the cloth you brought, we value the thread she brought, we value my effort. We make shirts and sell in the next town. So we move from Manchester to sell in Liverpool. And when we make profit, we come in and share it. Unfortunately, part of that story has to do with slave trade, when no, no one person was sufficiently rich to hire a ship, hire guns, people to shoot, come to Africa, arrest people who look like me, and sell them in the New World. And so they started getting together as groups of men and women and acquiring a royal charter to do this. That is how company law emerged, and that is how people started making bigger monies than trading alone. Historically, we don't work that way. We are more, we fly solo um, for the most part. What, what were our grandparents? They were hunters, farmers, gatherers, fisher folk, traders. Now, did you ever see that farm ABC uh, are, are next door to each other? The owners got together and said, you know what, let's merge our resources. Yeah. And um, so and we'll farm together and share. There was a Bunu and a Busan, but that had to do with tenant farmers. That's right. But in terms of combining lands into huge acreage, that was not in the farm. Leveraging the, scale. The, 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 there was precious little of that. And so the man dies and leaves, and the woman dies and leaves the farm to, to, uh, to, to, to the children. Maybe the children are not, in, are not interested in farming. And that's the end of it. And that, that's probably the, the, the end of the, of the venture. And so the idea of Hewlett Packard, that it is a person called Hewlett and a person called Packard who manage their resources and produce this humongous, gargantuan giant of a company that has survived many years does not exist, but it's only when our powers combine that, look, there are, there are very few Ghanaian firms that have moved and have survived the life of the founder. Very few. Now that's food for thought. We're going to take our final break. When we come back, we'll go into the back straight of this conversation that I wish wouldn't end. There's so much to learn when we come back. This is the Executive Lounge, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Shirado and my guest is Kojo Ananankuma. He's the managing partner of Bentiential Lecha and Ankuma, Ghana's largest law firm and arguably most successful. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I, I put a caveat in yeah, there arguably. by saying that arguably. arguably. Uh, arguably. I will argue that it's, 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 it's the most successful. Well. Uh, but, you know, it's quite interesting that both partners uh, who founded the firm are still practicing and yet they've taken a back seat and you are running uh, the ship. What's the concept? How have you executed the succession philosophy at Bela? Well, I, like I said, those, those two gentlemen are visionaries. They, 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 they I, I don't know what they saw in me, but of course, as you grow, and as you advance in age, mm -hmm. you begin to look at the future. You know, if you want what you've built to survive you. And so I, I was tapped to take this position. And the interesting thing was that they're still working. They're in the office morning to night, doing, pulling their hours, doing their shifts, carrying their, 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 their portion of the weight. 
And so I've had to manage with my bosses still working with me and um, still going to them for advice. And I call it wisdom. So I said, can I come, for, can, can I come up for some wisdom? And I'd go up and managing with them so that you speak a lot with them and you do a lot of consultation with them. And I've learned a lot through that. Look, you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm on overdrive. If you, if you leave me, I'm going to run the thing and burn the gasket <laughs> and forget to, to oil, oil it. That's right. And they're always there to say, take it easy. Take it easy. I mean, so the chest went, it's terrible. I mean, he's always saying terrible, you know, when I'm you know, running, scared, and could, could do as his own way of doing, doing that as well. So I've been, I've been blessed by having them on board for seven more years, you know. And the plan is that, look, I inherited a system. How do we develop it further? Going forward, are we going to build term limits for for managing partners, do you run a certain term? What do you do if you run a term as managing partner? Do you stay in or do you leave? Um, the, and so, so there, there are new things coming up, new thoughts coming up mm -hmm. based on the example they set. You know, you know so we are, we're running this, I'm, I'm seven years into it. I mean, I'll have proposal about what happens in 10 years, what happens in 15 years, what happens in 20 years. Are you gonna remain in the same place forever? Are you gonna have a five year term cycle where you need to be voted, you know, for your, your, your fellow partners to either vote their confidence in you or for another partner to say, you know what, I'm going to challenge you for the managing position. And these are some of the things that thoughts, and I trust me, whenever I've raised it with them, they, they've had a good laugh. <laughs> you know, like, you're, you're crazy. You know? they're, they're clearly seeing something <laughs> you're, you're not, not seeing. No, 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 yeah, no, you're stuck with this, okay? <laughs> just, just, just live with it. But I'll give you an example. I'm sure Kojo would like it, but I'll give you an example. I'm always talking about Kojo Benzian. There's a rule. There's a rule that if you don't file your business reports, you don't get paid. And I got a hint from admin that he, I think he had skipped a month or two. So I said, "Oh, how? This is scandalous." Now, why did I think it was scandalous? Not that he hadn't he hadn't filed his report because he hadn't been paid for two months. I said, "Ah, so we are starving him. Please pay this money." So I went up to him to say that, "Oh, coach, I'm very sorry. I hear that they haven't paid, I mean, I haven't taken advantage of. I haven't taken notice of it. I hear they haven't paid paid it for a month or two. They said, yes, and so what's that about? I said, oh, I've asked them to pay you. He said, sit down, why? I thought you were coming here to rebuke me for not filing my business report. You are here to say you're going to break the law for me. No, thank you. Now, I was like, wow, what man of man is this? You know, so I, I thought, I was, I, thought I, was, I was going to, oh, yes, you know, let's just, yeah, who will know? He says, no. So, <laughs> if, if you so live the structures under, work. Absolutely, and he won't break the law for himself. You know, so how can I break the structures? The man, the two men who, start, who started this, do not want me to break the law for them. How can I break the law for myself or for, or for any other person? But what does that is that it builds confidence in the structures. Now, you know, I, I, I believe in what they've built, and I can only move this a notch or more further and, and also have a succession plan Going, going along. So that, that's been the philosophy. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't have to be blood relationship. It doesn't have to be anything. It has to do with ability. And it's not just the legal ability. Whether the person can run the management. Look, I always make an example. I always say this about lawyers. The, the best comparison with what I can find in the animal kingdom to lawyers are cats. Mm. Now, you can herd goats, even goats, sheep, cows. You can walk and they'll follow you. Have you ever seen anybody herding cats? No, not no. even cats. I mean, I, 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 except the Pied Piper, right? That's right. <laughs> and even that, it was rats. Yeah. Because you can't, you can't lead a cat. Cats, I mean, if a cat is sitting in a chair and you get up, it's just look at you, curl up and sleep again. So imagine running 45 of them, <laughs> right? But so you have to learn a lot of skill, people skills. There are times things happen and I don't react. And I said, oh, I've changed. Because you have to learn a lot of people skills. You got to know which leadership skill to apply. I learned that, so I've learned that leadership is like a golf bag. There are different kinds of clubs to use. You don't use a driver all the time. You don't use a driver to putt. Yeah. The ball will fly. Absolutely. There are times you've got to hit the ball. There are times you, could, you literally have to caress the ball to get into where you want it to be. You get into a sand pit. A sand, a sand pit. There's another one. The the, 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 whether yeah. an iron or wood wet. Mm -hmm. you've got to, and you, got, you have to pick the right one, else you're going to mess up the entire game. And so leadership to me has always been like a, golf, like, like, like a golf bag. The situation determines the leadership skill that I deploy. 
And so you're not the same leader all the time. For example, you might be a very good democratic leader. You like consulting, your people like you. But if there's a flood, I still couldn't have a meeting before decide, deciding who, who, who should come and uh, you know, put, put it out or, or who should come and dry the place. But, and if you're also and, and, you know, the, the leader who likes, you know, I, I, like, I like to have my way, your staff are going to say, okay, then run the ship. You know? So leadership is not a natural state, I believe. It is, it's a golf bag. Mm. And it has different leadership skills. And you pull one out based on the situation, and then you deploy it. And that's what I've learned in, in these years and through succession and everything. And I would urge that let's everybody, look, you're not... You will die, you will retire, you will fall sick, you will get tired. And you, you need to put in place a structure that will survive you. But you must also respect that maybe a man or woman will decide that I don't want my business to survive me. It's a choice. That once I retire, I want my business to fold up. I'm not interested in, in, in pursuing anything more. That's that, or anything pursuing me, that's a choice. But if you want to look at a legacy and you want a firm to survive mm -hmm. you the way others have been able to do it, they really have to think about the kind of leadership you provide, who you're going to tap in, in terms of succession and having a succession plan. You follow Chelsea a lot, which I really can't figure out why. Um, uh, because I have, I have great taste in football, unlike you. Really? Yeah, you I want mean, to start the Arsenal-Chelsea problem again? I mean, really, when did really. Chelsea become a club? To it doesn't worry matter. About. We, we talk about today. In football, yesterday is history. So you are like ancient history. Forgotten. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> I've forgotten you're a, you're a litigant by trade. <laughs> what do you do in your spare time? I watch a lot of football. I listen to a lot of news. I play music. I argue with my kids. And I think. You think? Yeah, it's one of my hobbies. I, yeah. I, I create thinking time. So you have time. How do you have do time. it? You just... I just say... I, I just block everything and everything out. Spend two to three hours just sitting um, going through the things that I have to go through, figuring out that case has given me a tough time. How, how am I going to unravel this? Look, I, I literally live alone now. There are times, there's been once, once or twice that I've entered my room on Friday night and I haven't come out of the room till Monday morning. I can sit at the same spot for eight hours, just thinking, or watching TV. Okay, fooling around on, on social media. Mm -hmm. But yet, I'm at the same place. I didn't go out of my house. I have nowhere to go. I... <laughs> I'm not the visiting kind of person, you know, so I hardly ever... But you are welcoming. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that, that's how selfish it is. I, I'll welcome you to my house any day. Whatever it takes to attract you to come to my house, I'll, 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 I'll cook for you, come and eat, you know. But I, I, I keep myself a lot because I have a lot of work to do. And so, yes, also the, I, I, I learned to play a little bit of instruments and I have a full set down in my basement. Um, don't ask me the last time I went there. I've won all the things I've packed in my basement. I had just one um, nylon string acoustic guitar that sleeps on my bed with me. And occasionally I, I kind of fiddle around with it. And then I, I read a lot. I, like I said, I think I... Um, my family is scattered in four countries. And so we always must stay in touch. And we stay in touch through um, social media. We have our own like, family group. Because my wife is in the Gambia. My daughter is in Massachusetts. My son is in... Newcastle, and my other daughter is in um, boarding school in Tema, and I, I live in community 20. So we must stay in touch. So checking in on everybody, wait, what's up with you? How, how are your assignments going? I read over the assignments. I insist. I mean, I understand what you're, what you're, fine, what you're going to submit, but I want to read it. So you build accountability. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, they hide some from me, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I do read over the assignments. I may not have an answer, but I, I create time to read over some of the assignments. So, Daddy, can you read over this for me? Can you, can you spell check for me? Can you see whether I've organized my thoughts well? How yeah. important is it for a man with as busy a schedule as you have to have a hands-on approach to family time and raising the children? 24 hours is a long time. It's a lot of time, 24 hours, think about it. The reason why people don't have enough time is that they want to sleep minimum eight hours. Yeah, I know people are gonna argue with me on this, but I do five. Then I take time off to sleep, five, five and a half. I, I hardly do I sleep before midnight, but by 5.30 I'm up. Um, except, of, of course, weekends, but th th there's a lot you can do if you plan your time. I, I, I was teaching my team. I don't stop work 
I close. And for me, closing is a procedure. Closing means picking that sheet of paper in which I'd written my TTD, things to do, mm -hmm. and checking off the things I've done, and transferring it onto a new script, and adding what I have to do tomorrow. And then, uh, you know, trashing that one and moving. For me, closing is a procedure. So you make time for everything. So I know I had this interview with you. Mm -hmm. I had to create time for it. I had to do this. But I just make time. Once I go home, I'm going to, uh, there's a survey my daughter is doing. We're going to go home and do it. It's all planned and scheduled. And that's how I'm able to make time for everything. It's a long time. I, I, there's hardly anything that I don't, I don't have time for if I want to do it. Mm. Oh, you said you're playing some instrument as well. Yes, what? I... I'm a jack of all trades. I'm a master of none. I started a little piano um, when I was in primary school, but I kind of developed it in France. And I learned a little guitar, so both the lead and the bass. I think I, I'm better known for playing the lead. And then along the line, I, I was fascinated by the saxophone, and I'd always wanted to own one. And I walked, I, I'd, I'd, in one of my trips, I saw a beautiful saxophone. It was black and gold, mostly black with gold. And, and I asked, and they mentioned a figure that I, could, I, I couldn't afford. It's like 4,000 pounds or something like that. These guys crazy. So I walked out of the shop. A couple of years later, I went to the same shop and they said, oh, actually, there was one there for much less, like a tenth of the price. So there's a little cork that is spot and you just need super glue to put it back. But the price was down. I said, thank you. So I bought the a tenor sax mm -hmm. and learned how to play it. Wow. And um, so I played a little bit of everything. So I, you're, you're a band in, in one man. I, you I you could. play the lead. The bass, the piano, and the sax. And I play the drums too. And the drums. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a song on one of the Joyful albums where I played everything. Wow. You know, what? The 1991 album. There's one particular song, We Shall Be There. I did the mm -hmm. piano. I did every, but everything was kind of programmed. It's all like live drum. But That's right. Everything on it, you know, I, I played. Just one, just, just one. It's always the way to go, to do something to touch mankind and the people around you. Well, it's been great uh, hanging with you. Well, I've, I've had a very great. fulfilling time. And uh, by my own uh, request, uh, we will have to do a second part Oops. sometime later this year because there's a lot okay. of stuff that I don't think we've uh, explored yet. And um, our viewers can send us some uh, interesting thoughts on this one. You can send it to insura.addo at myjoyonline.com and we'll ask Ace all those questions in the next time we catch him. But well, we have a tradition. There's five things that I've picked from this conversation. The very first one is that hard work doesn't kill. It only gets, uh, makes you a better person and gives you a chance to um, sit at the top of the pile. And you must be determined, no matter what you face, don't stop. Keep pushing forward, keep going forward. And if you find yourself in uh, management or leadership, don't forget, leadership is like a golf bag. You choose what tool you need at the right time, depending on the situation you find yourself in. And also, number four, is that be true to yourself. Know who you are, know where your strengths lie, where your weaknesses are, and leverage those to your advantage. And the final thing is that no matter what you do, one day you won't be here. And when you're gone, what legacy will you leave? And to be able to leave a good legacy, and sure that you have built into whatever you're doing, the structures that allow people to come behind you to continue the good work that you've done. Ah, but I'll chip in. That Paul might plant, Apollos, Apollos might water, but it is the Lord who gives increase. What a final word to end with. I really appreciate that, Ace. Thank you so much, and we'll be back again on your screens. Thank you to Kuku Apia and the entire crew, and Villa Monticello for the venue as well as X-Men for the grooming. We'll be back. See you. Go forward, make rain, shalom. <laughs>